Great. Hi. Um, so firstly, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, so today I'm going to chat a little about uh, chat ops, uh, and specifically what I like to refer to as chat ops 2.0. Um, but before I get into that, I'll just give a, a slight bit of background to kind of establish my bona fides. So uh, I work at Slack. Um, how many of you use Slack either, you know, perfect? OK, well, OK. So a fair few of you. OK. So uh, Slack is, uh, we like to think of ourselves as a collaboration hub. We're more than just a, a chat tool. Um, and we're used uh, by a wide variety of companies and a bunch of different industries. And our mission is arguably pretty simple. We want to make uh, your working life simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And we're in the early stages of that mission. Uh, the and the momentum is continuing to build. Uh, today, there's over 8 million daily active users of Slack uh, across more than half a million organizations. We have more than 3 million paid users, and 65% of the Fortune 100 are paid Slack customers. We have more than 70,000 paid teams, many of which have thousands of active users, spread across departments, functions, borders, and oceans. And like I said, we have a fairly diverse customer set. Uh, we have everything from traditional technology companies like Spotify or Lyft, to retail companies like Target or Starbucks, to media companies like Condé Nast, Time, the LA Times. So it's a wide, a wide village of, of customers, and our tools have to reflect that. Uh, we need to be more than just IRC, essentially. And in order to make people's working lives more productive, we need to bring as much of their workflows into Slack as possible so that they can take actions in the rooms where they're, or, sorry, in the tools that they're already using. And so to help us achieve this, we have a fairly healthy developer ecosystem as well. We have over 1,500 apps in our app directory uh, and 200,000 developers building apps every week on Slack. Uh, and we, in addition to the 1,500 apps, we also have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of internal integrations which people have built internally in order to improve their workflows. That will, they, will never, they will never see the light of day outside of their company. So what's chat ops? Wikipedia defines chat ops as a collaborative, conversation-centric way of working that brings peoples, discussions, bots, tools, and files together in one central location, a workplace messaging app. And if that definition sounds relatively familiar, I think it's because it also reflects pretty well what Slack is and what we want Slack to be. So GitHub are largely credited with coming up with the term chat ops. Um, they started publicly using it around 2013. Uh, and the way they achieve that is through a tool they call Hubot. Uh, it's a fantastic way of working for teams that are constantly in chat. It wildly increases the transparency of actions. So every developer will know instantly when a deploy has happened, for instance. Uh, but it also helps when you're onboarding uh, new members of the team, because they can scroll back through the chat history and see pretty easily how the team likes to work, their cadence, you know, things that have worked in the past, things that haven't worked in the past. Another great example of chat ops is used by Shopify. Shopify are uh, an e-commerce platform. They're also a continuous integration and uh, deployment shop. So they deploy their code 50, 100 times a day, I think. And they've achieved this by building an integration for their Slack workspace called Spy. So what you're seeing here behind me is on the top left, uh, someone has decided to start deploying some code in the, the Shopify uh, workspace. So Spy is sending a DM to uh, the, every developer that has code going out in that release to let them know, look, we're deploying production right now. Here's the rev. Here's the, the, here's the commits that you have going out. And it's letting them know that they should do things like keep an eye on operations, watch graphs, make sure everything's fine. When the deploy is finished, they then get a follow-up message to let them know that the uh, deployment has, has happened. We think everything's gone fine. Um, but uh, if not, you should go test your changes in production, and you should start a rollback if there's an issue. On the right-hand side is Sp uh, Shopify's operations channel. And what's happening here is Spy is constantly feeding into this channel 
to let them know that a deployment is in progress, here's all the various commits that are going out, and it provides that visibility and that transparency that I spoke about. Everyone is on the same page. The other way that Shopify use chat ops is they use Spy to manage incidents. So I don't know how many of you are developers and if you've ever been involved in like a large-scale outage of your service, but it's not a particularly fun time. It's literally, by definition, it's not fun. And the more automation you add in there takes a, a lot of the pressure out of it. So anyway, someone has noticed an incident in whatever way they figured it out, and they've started it with using the spy incident command. What spy then does is, it notes, the beginning of the, uh, it notes the beginning of the incident time. It note, notes who the IMOC is, the incident manager on, on call. And it creates, a, uh, it creates a distinct room, in this case, war room, and encourages everyone to move all of the conversations related to that incident into that room. They also send a DM to the IMOC to let them know that an incident has begun and they should potentially get into this channel and also gives them some actions. So in this case, it wants them to update the status page to let Shopify's customers and, and developers know that there's an issue with the site and they're working to resolve it. But the one thing is, is depending on the severity of the outage, more and more people can get involved. And suddenly the room is very, very busy. And I'm sure we've all been in Slack channels or hip chat rooms or you know, team spaces. I don't know what Microsoft Teams call their spaces, but we've all been in these rooms. And there's constant communication happening. And it's an incident, and people are a little bit freaked out, and they're a little bit panicked, so they're, they're over-communicating, which is probably the right instinct. It's better to have lots of information you don't need than have miss a vital piece of information. So in order to get people up to speed as soon as they join the room as quickly as possible, Shopify created a TLDR command. So you, when you arrive into the room, you say spy incident TLDR. And SPY will give you a short summary of the incident and let you know what's happening. So in this instance, they've given a bit of detail. They've given the timeline. They let you know who the IMOC is, who the support response person is, what channel it's in, when the incident started, and all the people who are involved. So it's a really, really good way to get all of the context you need in a short, small bite. But if we look at SPY, and specifically the incident start command, Spy is a fantastic integration. Don't get me wrong, I love Spy. We use it widely as an example. I've just spoken for quite a few minutes about Spy. But what it is, is it's essentially a command line interface in your chat client. And if your audience are exclusively developers who are used to being on the command line all day, every day, and just always have the man page for all of the commands right there in their head, it works. It's fine. But like to start an incident, which is a fairly critical workflow for any company, using Spy, you have to remember five things. You have to remember the name of the tool. OK, we'll assume that everyone knows the name of the tool. You have to remember the action you want to take, in this case, incident. You have to then tell it you're starting an incident. You have to identify who the IMOC is. In this case, he's assigning it to himself. And you also have to remember to give some detail. And if you think about that, first of all, that's five things you need to remember, which is a lot for anyone. I can't even remember if it's source target or target source in Simlink. But you have to remember all of these things. The order could well be important. I don't, like, I don't know how robust SPY's handling of the parameters is. So if you say SPY incident start wholesale app data loss me, it might fail, and you've no way to know that before you start. So my general premise is that it's time for chat ops to evolve. It's a fantastic way of working for the reasons I've outlined. And more and more companies should adopt it. And we should be looking to spread it outside of just technical teams. Because as more and more teams move their conversations away from email and into chat clients, it no longer becomes the preserve of just technical teams. And if we want those teams to benefit from a chat ops style of working, we need to evolve beyond this command line interface in style of interactions. We need to build interfaces that go beyond text. Jane from accounting and Joe from HR, they don't want to remember a complex series of decision trees. They want to complete whatever their workflow is with as little fuss as possible. And they just want to get on and move on to their next task. 
So a ChatOps 2.0 designed app will proactively present people with options. It'll guide them through their workflows and won't rely on them to keep a manual in their head. So if you look at this example here, this is again spy incident, and I promise this is the last reference to spy. This is the spy incident command I talked about on the left. And on the right is an ops genie alert. So ops genie is like a, a monitoring tool. It's similar to like pager duty. Um, so what's happened here is somewhere in this company's fleet, the part of their server fleet has gone over 95% CPU for the last five minutes. So instead of relying on the user to know what to do, this app is presenting them with a bunch of options. You can acknowledge the alert. You can just close the alert. There's a bunch of other actions you can take which they've neatly, hided in, uh, neatly hidden into a dropdown. And you can also do things like you can choose uh, the user you want to assign the alert to. And instead of relying on everyone to know what the Unix name of you know, this developer over here is or this developer over here is, what Ops Genie is doing is presenting them with a list of all of the people who can be involved. And Ops Genie can decide how they want to format this and who, who is the right people to put into this list. But sometimes your workflow requires you to have much more detail in order to kick off the, the process. So if you look, at, think of an example of creating a task in Jira or GitHub or Asana or whatever. On the left-hand side would be a kind of a traditional chat ops 1.0 approach to this. Qbot, create, issue, issue description, issue owner, wider description of the issue. In a chat ops 2.0 world, users shouldn't need to care about the order of the arguments or even necessarily what the arguments are. Your app can give them that information, and it can do stuff like, in this example, it can let you know what fields are optional what fields are required. Like I said, you no longer need to care about the order of the parameters because the app is doing that for you. And you can do stuff like in the assignee, uh, the assignee section up here, you can again populate with a list of users. You could also go a step further and you could start providing helpful context. So you could evolve this dialog option here to have a status indicator, who's online and who's offline, because that's another piece of context that you can provide a user to let them make the right decision. So it might be, if it's time sensitive, it might make more sense to assign it to someone who's, uh, who's online. And if you take the concept one step further, why would you even wait for users to summon uh, your bot via command? You could provide the information based on the context of the conversation that's occurring. And that way, the users don't even need to know that your app exists you're proactively helping them to discover this way of working. So if you look at this example here, Jane, who I'm going to assume is from the sales team, is linking to Salesforce. I'm going to go wild and say I don't need to explain what Salesforce is. Um, and the Salesforce integration has, is listening to that. It spots the link. And it goes, OK, someone's linking to a piece of content. The odds are that they want some information. And the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to click the link. So why wait for them to click the link? And what it does is it comes in, it pulls all of this information, and just presents it right there in channel. And now everyone in the channel can see it and know exactly what the details of this enterprise account are. And then you can also add more actions so that you can click a button which will bring them over to the uh, bring them over to Salesforce.com, and they can provide all of the extra information that they need. And at this point, you might be thinking, this is all well and good, but I have finite resources and a hundred problems I can be tackling, and why would I bother changing our chat integration? It works. People are used to remembering the, the commands, and they're used to remembering everything about uh, the order parameters and all these kinds of things. But from what we've seen in Slack internally with apps on our app directory, is that moving to this style of uh, chat ops 2.0 and you know, in a more helpful context uh, way of designing the apps, you just get better results. So Poly is a team polling app. You allow it to, or it allows you to ask questions of your team inside of Slack, you know, important questions like what should this project be called, somewhat less important questions like where should we go for coffee. But either way, it's a bunch of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a quick and easy way to get feedback. When they initially built it, if you wanted to add a comment to a poll, you would have to go to Polly's website, 
type in the, the, the comment, and it would send that back into Slack. So instantly, you're kind of breaking a user's workflow by making them context switch over to your app. And it was a distracting workaround, and it left the conversion lower than they thought. So what they did was they took the comment function out of the website and put it inside a dialog inside of Slack. So now when you want to comment, you can pop it. You pop a, press a button, a dialog appears, you type your comment, you're done. You haven't had to context switch. You've given the, the, your colleague the feedback they need. So when they did this, they saw their conversion rate increase by almost 300%. And for their open-ended question feature, when they implemented a similar workflow, they saw an increase of 182%. So like, it's clear that these work. Another example is Growbot. Uh, they were called Growbot when they launched. They're now a company called Disco. What Disco is is a team appreciation app. And it gives you the ability to, um, it gives you the ability to give thanks, give kudos, and just let people know that you know, this colleague was really helpful today. And it builds team morale, and uh, it just creates a culture where people are acknowledged for the work that they're doing. Their onboarding process is really slick and well-regarded, and it's good reason. They've continually integrated on this part because they, they want to improve how easy it is for users to understand their app, especially if they've never used this kind of chat style of app before. So first, they manage their onboarding process through what we call slash commands. So if you've ever done like slash feedback or slash remind me in Slack, it's that kind of interaction. And they got a 15% conversion rate. So they thought, OK, this is a bit low. We can probably do better than this. What can we do? So they took a look at the, the documentation, and they came across message buttons. So now when Growbot is installed, it was offering to get a list of channels you could use. So in this case, oh, would you like to invite me to random? When you select it, they then follow up with a second message saying, look, would you like me to message your channel to let you know, or to let everyone in the channel know that I exist, and maybe they can start using me? So that was great, and they saw a 28% increase in their conversion rate. So they knew they were starting to see results, and they thought, what if we invest a little bit more? Where can we go with this? So they went back to the documentation, how to read around, how to think about it, and they realized, most workspaces have way more than like five channels. And this, this uh, UI would be completely unwieldy if, you ha if your workspace had like 50 channels. So what they did was they started using message menus. And what message menus are is essentially a drop down that allows you to search for more channels. So now they can click. They can get a list of all of the uh, channels that a user has access to. And it's customized for the viewing user. So if there's channels that they can see and others can't, they'll appear in this list. And this allows them to add Growbot to all of the channels and the most relevant channels instead of the kind of pre-canned ones that their initial implementation did. And again, they follow up with a message. They've tweaked the text a little. And they're asking people, would they like, would they like a Growbot to introduce itself in the channel? And when they saw this, they got a 42% conversion rate. So rolling it all back, what are the kind of principles of a chat ops 2.0 app, and what should you think about if you're thinking about adding this kind of flow to your, to your uh, application? So one, never, 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 never forget that a modern company is more than just software developers and other technical people. Your, a modern tool should seek to enable the most diverse set of users. Because in addition to your developers, you're going to have marketing people, you're going to have product managers, you're going to have HR people, finance people, uh, office administrators, and on and on and on. So your app should consider what their experience is like, and not just techies. Number two, don't force your users to remember a complex series of parameters in order to adopt your tool. Wherever possible, use UI elements and guide them through their workflow. You want them to succeed in their workflow, and they want to get their workflow complete. Wherever possible, provide as much contextual information as possible to speed up their workflows. If your app asks for a username to be inputted, provide the, all the possible options in a type ahead. 
if the list of options is super small and predetermined and you only, you know, you're asking a question that has three possible answers, then just add buttons and show it right then and there. Don't force the user again to, to think about it. Finally, remember that sometimes a user won't even know about your app, even if it's already installed in their workspace. So consider listening for relevant information in a channel and offering to help. This is an extension of the principle to guide users through their workflows by being right there at the start of their, their workflow. Just get in there like the Salesforce example I showed earlier. Get in there, give them the information they need. And now not only have they completed their workflow, but you've converted another user to this way of working. So hopefully, uh, after all of this, you're considering about where you need to go next. And if you're interested in enabling chat, ChatOps 2.0 workflows, specifically inside of a Slack workspace, here's some tips. First of all, don't reinvent the wheel. Nearly all of the major SaaS companies in the world integrate with Slack already. So before you go building an internal integration and pouring resources into, into connecting various different tools, just double check if there's already an integration. There's a good chance it is. And we've extended our platform far beyond the initial kind of suite of tools which were focused on developers. So in addition to AWS and GitHub integrations and Bitbucket and Datadog integrations, we now have Salesforce integrations, Zendesk integrations for your support team, Jira for your product managers, uh, Concur for your finance people, and on and on and on and on. If you're technically minded yourself and you want to just start coding and getting going, you can visit api.slack.com. We'll ha we have a bunch of code samples there, method documentation, much more. There's a Hello World style tutorial there. There's um, Slack uh, UX guidelines, which our designers have worked on, the principles that we follow when we're building integrations inside of Slack. If you're less technically minded and you want, still want to work with these workflows, or maybe you want to encourage your or others inside of your organization to serve their own organizations, give a person a fish type work. Zapier, If This Then That, and Mercado all have Slack integrations and allow basically zero code uh, requirements to integrate. And you can see here, Mercado allows you to do all sorts of uh, rich UX style. If you're Still finding that that isn't doing the, the trick, I can also suggest Missions, which has an extremely UI-focused workflow generation tool, and again, requires basically no code. If you want to start coding, but you don't want to have to provision servers, maintain DBs, anything like that, we have a bunch of uh, samples up on Glitch, which is a, a popular, I don't know how you define Glitch, Glitch is like a collaborative coding tool is the easiest way to do it. So you can take all of these, um, remix, uh, which is their term for kind of like forking it, um, take a copy of it, and Glitch maintains all of the servers, everything like that. It's totally free. You just click it, and they'll, spin up a, they'll stand up a server instantly and give you a URL. And these will get you started really, really quickly. If you're here today and technically minded, we're running a workshop later today at 1 PM. It's in room L8, which I believe is upstairs. Um, that'll be at 1 o'clock. Uh, I believe it's booked out. Uh, sorry, it's sold out. But I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. So uh, if you come along to room L8, what we're doing there is we're going to guide you through the processes and tools needed to build a Slack bot. We're going to go over our SDKs. We'll walk through an example app, and we'll talk about what's going on under the hood as the app is interacting with the APIs. The workshop is aimed at beginners, people who haven't integrated with Slack before, but there'll also be a number of Slack staff there. We'll be able to answer questions that you might have about, like I said, any of our SDKs or any of our developer tools. And they'll, uh, so if you're more experienced with Slack, there's probably plenty of value to be uh, derived as well. With that, um, I'm finished up now. Um, I'm happy to do q and I believe. We're using Slido, is my understanding. Um, so I'm happy to take your questions. I'll also be around for the whole day if you have any further questions. Thank you.
Okay, so let's see the questions. So the first thing, what is the thing you wish Slack had integration with today? What is the first thing you are missing the most? It's a tough one, right? Yeah. Um, my favorite Slack integrations are ones that like, are really silly and simple um, and are more fun because the kind of serious work stuff has kind of been boxed off. Um, so there's a company in the States, they're like a, a marketing or ad agency, and they've hooked up Amazon Internet of Things buttons. So they've put it beside the coffee machine. So every time there's a big, bo uh, big thing of coffee ready, someone just presses the button, and the Slack bot notifies everyone that there's a cup of coffee ready in the office because they use like, um, like cold brew filtered. So like, you know, a pot of it takes like a month. <laughs> That's really nice. Next question. How can we make sure the content is viewed by only and all relevant people without flooding everyone with too much irrelevant information? Yeah, good question. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, Slack allows you to post what we call ephemeral messages, um, which are in the context of the channel, but they're only view viewable by a single user. Um, so the common use case of these is um, if, you've ta if you've just taken an action with the application, instead of messaging everyone to let, you to let them know that the command is six, six, six successfully run, uh, you message back to just that single user to let them know. Um, I think it's also just about the design. Is, like, the flooding everyone is a, is a good point, because Slack channels can be noisy at the best of times. So uh, I think it's just being about careful about how much information. Be, like, be really thoughtful in your design about the easiest way to do it. You can also DM users so that they don't yeah, have like to. Yeah, you can create a separate channels and yeah, 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 yeah. post to them. OK, uh, can this be used in automating complex business processes in corporations such as banks or financial or insurance companies? Yeah, yeah, we have a bunch of uh, organizations that would traditionally be regarded as not particularly technically forward. Um, um, but the, we have a bunch of them on Slack, and they are, they're doing everything. Um, like uh, a really kind of common and relatively sensitive one is like um, recruiting decisions. So like uh, Greenhouse, which is an applicant tracking system, integrate with Slack, and you can basically go through the entire hiring process in Slack, in, like up to and including like approving the person's salary and stuff like that. Um, so you can see the biggest challenge we face with kind of large corporates like banks and insurance companies is regulatory ones. They're mm. a little bit freaked out about the notion of the information being stored up in AWS. And having some techie yeah, having some yeah. Really crazy tech. But that's mostly how Slack evolves in companies. The techies start using it, and then eventually so many people start using it that they're like, okay, we better actually centrally organize this now. Okay, how does the size and working style of an organization relate to using or not using chatups? Or does it at all? I think chat up scales fairly well. I think like it how should it change the way they use it? Um, I think basically the, the way it scales is it just kind of breaks into smaller pieces. So like you'll initially like my last company was like a small 30 person startup. And we had very few channels, and there was lots of activity in them. But as we grew, like Slack has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of channels. We basically just subdivide to like the smallest possible unit. Okay. Um, so I think, I think that's basically how it is. But it's like a chat up scales with your chat clients, so it works pretty well. Okay. And the last question for today, I guess this is quite a popular topic nowadays in Europe, for the regulation purposes, so how secure is confidential content within Slack? Uh, super secure. <laughs> we have, uh, so the, the, the non-jokey answer is on slack.com slash security, I think it is. And um, there's a fairly detailed breakdown. We're all sorts of compliance with all sorts of things, and we take the, uh, we take the security of our users' data extremely, extremely seriously. OK, so if user decides to have their complete information, complete history removed from Slack, this is possible already? Yeah, I think once you delete your workspace, we automatically nuke all of your data pretty quickly. And okay. It's going to be the law in a few weeks anyway. So we're cool. fully GDPR compliant and all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Thank you for your talk and for the answers. Thank you. And have a nice day.
Thank you. And for the rest of you.